Good afternoon, everyone. This is my great pleasure to introduce today's seminar speaker, Dr. Vivian Irish from Yale. Currently, Dr. Irish is a chair and a Daniel C. Aiton Professor of the Molecular, Cellular, and the Developmental Biology at Yale University. Dr. Irish obtained her PhD in Cellular and Developmental Biology from Harvard University. As a graduate student, she explored the function of the key TGF beta signaling pathway in specifying dorsal ventral polarity of in Drosophila embryos. As an Jan Coffin Child's postdoc fellow in Cambridge University, she illustrated how maternal effect and the homeotic genes act to establish the polarity of Drosophila embryos. After that, Dr. Irish turned her attention to explore patterning formation in Arabidopsis flowers as, as a National Science Foundation postdoc fellow with Anne Sussex at Yale University. After that, she joined the faculty at Yale using molecular genetic genomic and, and comp computational modeling approaches. Dr. Irish group focusing on understanding how plants regulate the developmental plasticity to elaborate particular organ types. She characterized the multiple key genes and the key pathways regulating organogenesis and the growth in the flower and explored both conserved and the lineage specific regulatory pathways across different flowering plants. Her work ranges from investigating how the stem cell homeostasis is regulated, how the plant st stem cell proliferate, to how the biomechanical force regulates the specification of organs and the different cell types. Today, Dr. Irish will talk about her recent work of the stem, plant stem cell regulation in a new model system, Citrus. So please join me to welcome Dr. Irish. Thank you, Yun. That was very kind of you. Um, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, it's been a wonderful day. I really enjoyed all my chats with people. Um, and so now I'll have a chance to, to bend your ear a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing uh, in the past uh, 10 years or so now. Um, and I'm going to tell you about um, a project, as I said, that we started about 10 years ago, um, which really came out of my interest in meristems and stem cell identity. Um, which has to do with how thorns are how thorns develop in citrus plants, um, and so this is a citrus plant, and I'll I'll come back to this uh, in a few minutes. But let me just introduce you to the meristem as a, as a group of plant biologists. I think you're all very familiar with how meristems look. This is a typical angiosperm meristem, and you can shoot apical meristem, and you can see the shoot apical meristem here organized into layers. And the primary shoot apical meristem is going to give rise to all of the above ground portions of the plant. Um, and I just want to make sure that you, you remember that on the flanks of the primary shoot apical meristem are regions that will produce branches. These are the axillary meristems, and they have the same general organization as the shoot apical meristem, as the primary shoot apical meristem. So the plant is going to um, form shoot structures in a reiterated manner from the action of these meristems. So um, we can look at the uh, what uh, the organization of the meristem in a little bit more detail in terms of the genes and gene products that are uh, necessary for maintaining this meristem architecture. And we can think of this shoot apical meristem as a region, as a stem cell niche. Um, and the way the cells are organized in this stem cell niche is important for maintaining the homeostasis of the stem cell population. So the stem cell uh, population proper is illustrated here in blue in the shoot, ap shoot apical meristem with uh, surrounding cells in the peripheral zone indicated in orange, and then cells in the underlying uh, organizing center underneath the uh, stem cell population proper is illustrated here in pink. And that organizing center is the source of uh, a number of signals that are required to maintain the stem cell population. So notably, one of the gene products that's important in this region in this organizing center of the meristem is a gene uh, 
uh, called Wuschel, um, which encodes a homeodomain containing transcription factor. And we know a lot at this point from many, many different uh, experiments um, from a number of different labs as to how Wuschel expression is maintained in this organizing center through hormonal signals, uh, Clavada uh, dependent signals, et cetera, and how Wuschel in turn uh, re regulates uh, the maintenance of the stem cell population here in blue. So, so Wuschel is a really a key gene in maintaining the overall organization and function of the shoot apical meristem in plant growth and development. Okay, so the reason I got interested in thorns um, is actually due to my interest in floral meristem. So let me tell you a little bit more about how the floral meristem operates. Um, so I just told you that Wuschel is a key uh, factor in maintaining shoot apical meristem function, and that is true during vegetative plant development. But something very different happens during floral development. So as I mentioned, Wuschel is important for maintaining stem cell homeostasis in the meristem. But when a, when a plant, um, for instance, Arabidopsis in this example, undergoes um, the transition to flowering in response to environmental signals, one of the, the key steps in this environmental signaling process is to turn on the expression of a transcription factor called leafy. So leafy interacts with the Wuschel gene product to turn on another uh, factor in the uh, young floral meristem called agamus, which encodes a MADS domain con con containing transcription factor. So in response to Wuschel and Leafy uh, interactions and the uh, activation of agamus expression, agamus in turn induces a cascade of events that culminates in the downregulation of Wuschel. So once agamus is activated uh, in response to these floral inductive cues in conjunction with Wuschel, agamus in turn uh, induces the expression um, of a gene called knuckles through the loss of uh, histone 3 K27 uh, trimethylation marks. Knuckles, Knuckles is a uh, transcriptional repressor, so it will act to repress Wuschel activity. And agamus also acts through a, what is apparently a second pathway, recruiting uh, polycomb group proteins to increase uh, H3K27 trimethylation at the Wuschel locus itself. So those two pathways, at least uh, together, uh, appear to be sufficient to downregulate Wuschel uh, in this developing uh, floral meristem. And so this causes the floral meristem to terminate stem cell proliferation and instead go on to uh, terminally differentiate. So this transition from the maintenance of stem cell activity to the termination of stem cell activity is called determinant development. Uh, and this is important in the elaboration of the flower. Okay, and so in, in, uh, as a result of the, these regulatory processes, Wuschel is downregulated. Okay, so we know something about how this pathway operates in flowers to, to induce this determinant uh, terminal differentiation process and this determinacy of the flower. And so it was actually based on this information that we had about flowers that got me to thinking about what's happening in other situations where meristems naturally terminally differentiate. And so I got interested in looking at thorns. So what I've told you, whoops, let me go back a second. What I've told you already is that in response to these floral inductive cues, uh, we know that floral meristems arrest their proliferation and terminally differentiate. And thorns actually represent a very unusual case of this type of determinacy. So thorns represent axillary meristems that undergo uh, a, de a determinacy event where they uh, act as meristems, um, stem, stem cells proliferate early on, and then the thorns terminally differentiate. And so really what um, we became interested in is, is a very simple question. Do thorns actually employ a very similar uh, process to flowers to terminate meristem proliferation, or is it a very distinct process? How do, how do thorns terminate the stem cell uh, maintenance in this case? So, um, so this is why I got interested in thorns many years ago. Um, and so just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I want to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about when I talk about thorns. 
So as I said before, thorns actually represent modified axillary meristems. Um, and so here is an example here on the right. This is uh, an example of Ponsiris. And you can always recognize the thorn because it's sitting in the axle of a subtending leaf, as you see here. So thorns are one type of sharp, spiky object that plants produce to deter uh, herbivores and predators. But plants can also produce other types of sharp, spiky objects, such as prickles, which are modified trichomes here on the left, or spines, which are modified leaves or bracts. But really, what we're talking about today are thorns, um, because we're really interested in this process of terminating stem cell proliferation in this unusual structure. Okay, so, um, so when I was thinking about thorns and thinking about how to uh, tackle this question of what thorns are doing, I wanted to find a system where I could study thorns uh, in, a, in, a, in a system that was amenable to manipulations. Um, and it turns out that thorns have actually arisen multiple times independently uh, during angiosperm uh, evolution. And you can see some of the species um, and genera that uh, produced thorns illustrated here in this, in this uh, phylogeny. And I actually played around with a few different species that are listed here, and I eventually settled on uh, the Rutaceae uh, citrus, which is situated here in the roses, uh, in the Sapindales right here. And there are a couple of reasons I decided to work on citrus um, as a model system for studying thorn development in part because it's, a, it's an important crop species. Um, but also I, I would say more importantly is because uh, citrus uh, sitting here in the Sapindales is relatively closely allied with the Brassicales, which is where Arabidopsis sits. So it's phylogenetically um, sort of a short hop from the Brassicales where we have a, a number of tools uh, in Arabidopsis to uh, then apply those tools and resources to uh, a, a situation like citrus. So, um, so we embarked on using citrus, um, and as I mentioned, it's closely allied with Arabidopsis. And I should mention um, that there's a number of different citrus species and cultivars and varieties. Uh, many, many of these uh, species possess thorns. So as a group, as a, as a, as a genus, uh, most of the species do possess thorns. So that's a useful attribute for us to work with. Uh, and it turns out that economically citrus is very important as well. It's, in fact, uh, the citrus uh, genus as a whole is the most important fruit crop in the U.S. Um, in terms of uh, millions of dollars. <laughs> um, more importantly to us as basic research scientists, um, we're interested in citrus also because, um, partly because it's an important fruit crop, there are a lot of genomic resources available for working with citrus. Um, so these uh, resources um, uh, included things like a, a number of genome sequences uh, that were available. Now there's more, this slide's a little bit out of date, um, but there's been a number of species and cultivars that uh, have very good sequence information available to us. Uh, but what was lacking with citrus um, at the time that we started about eight to 10 years ago um, were really good functional molecular genetic tools available um, that we needed to perturb gene function. So that's really what we focused on for the first few years was just trying to develop this as a system with the goal of whether or not we could define a molecular mechanism responsible for terminating stem cell proliferation. Um, and, and is that molecular mechanism uh, that's responsible for producing thorns, anything like the mechanism that's responsible for producing flowers in Arabidopsis, for instance. Um, so let me introduce you to the actual citrus cultivar that we're using in the lab. Um, this is a cultivar called Citrange. Um, it's a hybrid uh, sweet orange. Um, and uh, it looks like this from a side view, um, and it produces thorns uh, in a very nice reproducible manner, which you can see here. Thorns are produced at every node, um, and they're set, set a little bit offset from the sum tending leaf, which you can see here in this uh, above the, the sort of bird's eye view of the plant. So here's a leaf, and here's the associated thorn with that leaf. And I'll come back to this patterning process later on in my talk. Okay, so. Um, we can look at the development of the thorn, um, and it's actually a very simple, straightforward process. Um, we can look at early stages. So these are SEMs and some light microscopy um, 
versions of, Thor of uh, different stages of development. And thorns develop, uh, as I think you've gathered at this point, in the axle of the subtending leaf. There's actually two meristems in this subtending leaf area. Um, there's the thorn meristem, and adjacent to it is an axillary meristem, a, a traditional axillary meristem covered by a bract, which is labeled here in B. The thorn develops initially as just sort of a round, typically looking uh, meristem, uh, and eventually becomes a little bit more pointed by stage seven or stage eight. It starts to definitely change its shape by stage eight. And it basically just continues to grow in this elongated fashion until about stage 18, uh, where you start to see over uh, signals of that terminal differentiation. So not very exciting developmental process, but there it is. Um, but we can look at how thorns are actually developing um, and they develop in a bicipital manner in that uh, the terminal differentiation process occurs from the tip downward. So here we have three examples of thorns. We stain them with fluoroglucinol to look at lignification. And you can see by stage 16, there's considerable lignification at the tip of the thorn, um, sort of moving down towards the base of the thorn. We can look at this in cross sections here, and we can see lignification you know, throughout the, the sort of more apical region of the thorn. And conversely, if we look at histone H4 as a marker of cell division, we see that cell divisions are continuing still uh, at this stage 16 in the basal part of the thorn. So cell divisions have ceased by this point in the apical part and are maintained a little bit later towards the basal part. So to get back to the question of what are the genes and regulatory processes that are important um, in regulating um, thorn production, um, the first thing to just ascertain is, is the thorn meristem actually behaving like a typical axillary meristem? Is it expressing wuschel? So that was just one of the very first questions. Um, so we looked at various stages of development um, and we could see uh, wuschel is being expressed early on. These are cross sections through uh, the stages illustrated above here. So you're looking at a cross section through the thorn meristem and the associated axillary meristem, which is wrapped by a bract. Um, and we can see Wuschel expression early on. That expression is also present in the axillary meristem. You can see it a little bit better in this panel here. That Wuschel expression is maintained early on, but similar to what happens during floral development, that Wuschel expression is downregulated relatively early in thorn development, although we still see the maintenance of Wuschel expression in the axillary meristem. So Wuschel expression in the thorn meristem is downregulated during development. OK. Um, and so the, one of the first questions we, sim we asked was simply, is agamus doing the similar kind of role in this vegetative context as it does in a floral context? Um, and so we simply asked, is agamus expressed perhaps ectopically uh, in the vegetative portion of a citrus plant to downregulate Wuschel to produce uh, thorns? And the answer is no. Um, so we just looked at agamus expression in shoots, as you see here, uh, and also flowers and fruits as a control, as well as some control uh, uh, other genes. And we, could, we never could detect any agamus expression in the shoot, suggesting that agamus has nothing to do with this downregulation of Wuschel in the vegetative thorn meristems. So we had to think uh, differently about what might be downregulating Wuschel to uh, induce this determinacy in thorns. And so the, the a process that we took to try and identify genes that might be important in, the, in this downregulation of Wuschel was to do some uh, transcriptomic analyses comparing uh, various uh, citrus cultivars and species. Um, and we did, as I mentioned, many citrus species do have thorns, but there are some that lack thorns. Um, so we looked at uh, a thornless lime in comparison um, to a thorny lime, as well as a thorned uh, version, uh, a thorned uh, citrus uh, species, Citrus medica, which is citron, as well as a thornless uh, species, Clymenia. And we compared all of these uh, transcriptomes and we isolated a number of candidate genes that we thought might be important in thorn production. And amongst those genes that we identified was a gene um, uh, 
that uh, we called Thorn Identity One, and you'll see why in a moment, that's expressed, that was a differentially expressed in Thorn versus Thornless cultivars, expressed more strongly in Thorned cultivars versus the Thornless cultivars. So uh, Thorn Identity One includes a TCP type transcription factor um, of the uh, CYCTB1 family. Um, and so we thought this was a good candidate for being involved uh, in this pathway, in this regulation of bushel expression and thorn uh, development. So we looked first at TI1 expression um, and expressed predominantly, it's not expressed very strongly, but it is expressed predominantly in the thorn. And you can see it at, at sort of these mid stages of thorn development. And we also identified a paralogous gene, TI2, uh, very closely related to TI1, which was expressed um, both in the thorn meristem and also in the axillary meristem. So it's expressed a little bit more broadly than um, what we saw for TI1. So they're both expressed in citrus thorns. So to start to, let me just back up a moment, um, to start to try and analyze what these genes might be actually doing in regulating Wuschel, of course, we had to be able to manipulate the function of these genes. We wanted to be able to knock out genes in citrus. Uh, at the time that we started this, um, there weren't really very good uh, approaches for doing this in citrus. Um, and we wanted, of course, to take a CRISPR-Cas9 approach to knocking out uh, target genes of interest. Uh, so we, we embarked on a, on a series of experiments to uh, develop functional tools for citrus. Um, and so one of the tools we did develop was uh, a, an approach, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 approach. And in collaboration with Yannick Jacobs lab, um, we looked at uh, the ways that we could uh, efficiently uh, induce CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing in citrus. And part of that involved just uh, trying to get CRISPR-Cas9 to function more efficiently in plants in general. And as part of that study, what we did was we looked at the ability of heat stress to improve the ability of CRISPR-Cas9 to generate um, targeted cuts. Um, and so with heat stress, as you can see here, and this is using flow cytometry, using uh, looking at Arabidopsis cells in this case, um, Basically, when we heat stress the plants, we got much more efficient CRISPR-Cas9 activity. And in hindsight, that, that makes a lot of sense. The enzyme um, evolved to function at 37 degrees, um, and also heat stress likely is opening up the chromatin um, so that it's more relaxed, more accessible for the machinery to, to cause uh, targeted cuts. And indeed, um, as it turns out, um, when we applied this, this methodology um, to citrus, we could get really effective gene editing um, such that we could get homozygous or biallelic mutations really very rapidly uh, in, the, in the plants that we were actually introducing the CRISPR-Cas9 constructs into. So in this case, what we're doing is we're knocking out PDS, um, which uh, is a, a gene that um, is important for chlorophyll biosynthesis. And if we knock it out, we get a, an albino phenotype. And so using this approach, this heat stress approach uh, and a regime in, indicated at the top, we could get very efficient CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing in citrus. You can see without heat stress, we can get editing. Uh, you may be able to see these little albino patches here, but it's much more efficient with the heat stress. Uh, so we, had a, we now have a system where we can uh, manipulate gene function in citrus. So we could simply ask the question, can we uh, manipulate um, these genes um, and ask what is their role uh, in thorn development? So the first uh, gene we, we targeted um, for CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing was the TI1 gene. Um, and uh, you can see here in these overview pictures that if we uh, eliminate TI1 function via CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, we get much more branchy plants. And that's because we're turning the thorns into uh, basically into branches. Um, so in this control plant, we're maintaining thorns at each node here. But in this, uh, in this example here, the thorns are being turned into, into branches. So they're losing that determinacy. They're maintaining that stem cell, they're maintaining that stem cell identity, maintaining that proliferative capacity of the stem cells. 
So if you lose TI1, you maintain that, that uh, indeterminate uh, meristematic potential and get bush, bushier plants, which have uh, more branches. We uh, verified this result using RNAi. Um, we got a down regulation of TI1 uh, in this case, so not a total knockout, but again, you can see a par partial transformation of thorns uh, into uh, more branch-like structures, as you can see here. So we could see a transformation again of thorns into branch-like structures in the RNAi knockdown of TI1. So we did the similar kind of thing for TI2, um, the other paralogous gene of this family that we're interested in. And we saw a slightly different phenotype when we knocked down TI2. We got the transformation of um, the thorns into branches. So we've lost that determinacy of the thorn and it's, it's now developing as a branch. And in addition, the normally dormant axillary meristem grew out into a branch as well. So we got uh, a transformation of thorns into branching and increased uh, activity of the uh, normally dormant axillary meristems. So that resulted in a very bushy, um, a, a bushier plant as well. And finally, um, we made a double mutant where we knocked out both TI1 and TI2 using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. And we got a very bushy plant, which you can see here, and we could quantitate all of these changes. And basically what's happening uh, in these double mutants is that many, many of the thorns are being transformed into branches and the axillary, the normal axillary meristems are also growing out into branches as well. So we get a very bushy plant here. All right, so let me summarize this very first part of my talk uh, here. Thorns are rising from these determinate meristems. They differentiate in a bicipital manner from tip to base. Uh, concomitant with that determinacy event, Wuschel is downregulated in thorn primordia at about stage eight. And concomitant with that downregulation of Wuschel, we start to see expression of TI1 and TI2. Um, and these encode a particular family of transcription factors and that are required for thorn determinacy because when we eliminate their function, we no, no longer have that determinacy of the thorns. Okay, so we wanted to understand um, um, more mechanistically what was going on in this uh, in this pathway. Um, so we turned to developing a protoplast assay system to to try and address some of these questions. Um, so we um, uh, Fei Zhang, a postdoc in the lab, developed a very nice protoplast system, which you can see here, similar to what's done in Arabidopsis. And we can use those protoplasts for a variety of different assays. So I'll, I'll mention some of these assays later on in my talk. Um, and, and many of these that we did with this protoplast assay system. So one of the things that we did was we carried out dual, luciferate, dual luciferase assays um, to look as to whether or not TI1 or TI2 um, were specifically negatively regulating Wuschel expression. So we have a reporter gene here with the promoter of the citrus version of Wuschel, um, hooked up to a mini 35S promoter driving luciferase expression, and then um, a sort of a, a metric for the activity of this uh, tester. We had Ranilla hooked up to 35S promoter. And then we introduced various effectors uh, in the, using this protoplast assay system to ask whether or not these effectors could downregulate expression um, of Wuschel in this, in this context. And for both TI1 and PI, TI2, we could see downregulation of Wuschel uh, through this dual separase assay. Um, we further went on to mutate uh, sites in the citrus Wuschel promoter to determine uh, what sites were important for this downregulation. So in this particular assay, again, using um, this protoplast assay system, we use different effectors, a control effector, in this case, uh, the TI1 uh, effector, um, and asked what was the, the uh, output of mutating um, various uh, candidate uh, binding sites of this TCP transcription factor to two sites that we had identified in the Wuschel promoter that might be uh, targets for TCP transcription factor binding. So we made mutants in one of these sites, uh, P1, mutants in P2, or mutants in both of them. And basically, if we um, mutate P1 either alone or in the context of P2, 
we lose the down regulation of Wuschel, indicating that TI1 is likely uh, binding directly to the PI1 site. Uh, certainly important for this, uh, this PI1 site is important for the Wuschel down regulation. Um, I also carried out chip assays. Uh, we could show um, through chip assays that TI1 is binding, uh, again, to sequences in the Wuschel promoter, uh, to the P1 site in particular, quite strongly. And finally, we could mutate that PI1 site in vivo. Um, and um, when we did that, um, in, in this context here, uh, in the, this panel down below, that also promoted thorn to branch conversions and additional axillary branching, suggesting that this site in the Wuschel promoter is important for this downregulation activity that's important for thorn determinacy. Okay, so then sort of conversely, um, we could ask whether or not um, a topic expression of uh, Wuschel, um, and we drove this ectopic expression through the uh, through using the TI1 promoter to drive Wuschel expression. Can we actually now turn these uh, thorn meristems into uh, axillary meristems in this way? Um, and we could. Um, and what we got were what sort of looked like dormant axillary meristems. Okay, so to summarize the second part. Um, what we think is going on in thorn development is that Wuschel is turned on initially, um, early on in thorn development. Um, and Wuschel is inducing the expression of TI1 and TI2. Uh, and we could show uh, that TI1 is binding to sequences specifically in the Wuschel promoter. Um, and that, that this little regulatory pathway is important for deter determinant thorn development. And so what I want to emphasize at this point is that these, um, these promoter sequences that are important in the Wuschel promoter for TI1 binding and Wuschel and the concomitant downregulation of Wuschel have appear to have evolved within um, the genus Citrus. Um, so uh, we're, we're trying to figure out exactly um, where these new cis regulatory sites, uh, when they evolved, um, but they're not present uh, in the Arabidopsis promoter. So um, somewhere between um, the evolution of citrus uh, uh, from Arabidopsis or from the lineage leading to Arabidopsis, there was the accumulation of a novel site in the Wuschel promoter, which permitted this downregulation process to take place. So this, uh, not these novel sites, these novel sequences in this citrus social promoter are required for this determinant development that we see uh, in thorns and citrus. Okay, so I'm gonna now move on um, to sort of the second study that we carried out to try and figure out. So we've looked, we've, we've characterized a little bit as to how thorn meristem identity is established through the action of TI1 and TI2 in the downregulation of Wuschel to promote that determinant development. Uh, and But we wanted to really understand what's the difference between the thorn meristem and the axillary meristem. So here I'm illustrating for you again the subtending leaf. The thorn is, uh, is produced at an offset angle. The axillary meristem, the normal axillary meristem that will produce a branch is, is sort of offset to the other in the other side. And this phylotaxy is very, very regular. So we wanted to understand this difference between thorn and axillary meristem, these two meristems that sit right next to each other but have very different developmental outcomes. So again, going, uh, going back to looking at some of our transcriptomics, we identified um, another gene, um, citrus sen, uh, sen um, which is a member of the sen family um, that's important for maintaining uh, or mediating inflorescence architecture. And we showed that sen um, is expressed, as you can see here, um, in the developing uh, axillary meristem predominantly. Um, and so when we mutated sen, um, we saw, and, and what I'm illustrating here is, um, is in the wild type, uh, a stem of citrus where we've removed all the leaves. So you can see the thorns very well. And in this sen mutant that we induced using CRISPR-Cas9, we get the formation of two thorns at each node, um, representing the normal thorn plus 
this um, axillary meristem that is now transformed into a thorn. So sen is required for axillary bud identity in citrus. Um, so we could um, overexpress sen, again, introduce it into citrus plants, and that would result in a transformation of thorns into axillary buds. So we overexpress sen, so presumably it's being expressed uh, throughout the plant. Uh, and what we did was to sort of visualize better um, what was going on is we decapitated these plants and allowed the axillary meristems to grow out. And wild type, you could see you get a thorn, the typical thorn is being produced, and then the axillary meristem grows out after 14 days. In the 35S uh, sen uh, plants, we get the normal axillary meristem growing out, and we get a thorn transformed into an axillary meristem also growing out. And that is consistent with the fact that in the sen overexpression lines, TI1 expression is downregulated. So you need TI1 expression to maintain that determinacy. And if sen is overexpressed, uh, TI1 expression uh, is downregulated. And so that you, you alleviate that repression and allow for axillary meristem uh, identity to ensue or the outgrowth of those meristems. Okay, so we also, so uh, SEN is, is, not a, is not a canonical transcription factor, so we didn't think that SEN itself was involved in the transcriptional regulation um, of downstream uh, targets. Um, but we did know um, from work in Arabidopsis that um, SEN interacts uh, with a known transcription factor, FD. Um, and so we assayed whether or not SEN um, might be interacting with FD to perhaps regulate TI1 expression. And in fact, it does. So first we showed that SEN uh, uh, using um, a split YFP system, we showed that SEN could introduce, SEN could inter interact with FD. Uh, you can see that interaction here in the YFP panel. Uh, here we have just a, a panel showing where the nuclei are, and we can see in the merge panel that uh, SEN and FD are, are uh, interacting in the nuclei. Also through co precipitation, we could show that SEN and FD interact. And then furthermore, through again, through dual, dual luciferase assay, we could show that the presence of FD and SEN were necessary for downregulation of the TI1 promoter. So this information led us to this model that SEN in conjunction with FD is downregulating TI1. And TI1 in turn, as we've shown before, is important for downregulating Wuschel. So in the axillary meristem, SEN plus FD is uh, resulting in this cascade of events. So let me summarize this, this third part of my talk. Um, I've shown you just in the, in the past few slides that SEN interacts with FD um, and that in, in this FD transcription factor and together SEN and FD downregulate TI1. So in the axillary meristems, this uh, pathway is downregulating, allowing for the expression of Wuschel and allowing for the maintenance of stem cell activity in the axillary meristem. In the thorn meristem, SEN is not expressed normally in the thorn meristem. So TI1 is expressed uh, by about stage eight, and that expression of TI1 and TI2 in the thorn meristem is sufficient to downregulate Wuschel and induce that determinacy event. So we have different pathways operating in the axillary meristem and in the thorn meristem. Okay, so, so um, I wanna move on now um, to talk a little bit more about the placement um, of the thorn and the axillary bud. So as I introduced at the very beginning, um, thorns are arising in the axils of each of these leaves. The axillary bud is adjacent um, to this thorn in the axle of this leaf. And we can illustrate it in a little cartoon that looks something like this. So each of these um, green semicircles represents a leaf primordium. And in the axle of that leaf primordium is both a thorn primordium and an axillary bud primordium. And as I mentioned, this phylotaxy, this pattern of arrangement of thorns and axillary buds is very, very consistent um, in any individual plant. We get this consistent phylotaxy. 
So one of the things that we're trying to look at now is whether or not auxin is ag actually regulating this differential between thorn and axillary bud. Um, because these, as I mentioned, these axillary, the, these meristems, this axillary meristem and this thorn meristem are sitting right next to each other. They're expressing different gene products. They're acting in very different ways. And yet, yet they are arising in a very similar location with similar signals. So we think auxin might be important um, in specifying the, the distinction between uh, thorn meristem and axillary meristem. So the first thing that we're trying to do is just simply visualize auxin and the pattern of auxin in these young primordia and whether or not there is a gradient of auxin across the primordium that could be important in the patterning of the thorn meristem versus the axillary meristem. And we're doing this using two different uh, reporters. We're using a transcriptional reporter of auxin. We're also using a Degron-based reporter of auxin. And this is not um, sort of a new idea. This kind of gradient across a primordium um, of auxin activity has been seen, for instance, in tomato. Um, and Neelama Sinha's group have shown that there's actually a little bit of a difference between one side of a leaf and a the other in terms of auxin production. So we think that this might be what's going on. And we envisualize um, that there might be um, two different types of outcomes. It may be that the auxin gradient, which we're postulating is occurring, is, a, is a sort of irrelevant for the difference between, um, between axillary meristems and thorn meristems. Or it could be that, um, that these uh, thorn and axillary meristems are feeding back on the auxin distribution um, and, some, and that there is a, a feedback loop between auxin and meristem identity, um, such that the identity of these different meristems is going to condition what the outcome of auxin signaling is. So this is, uh, these are experiments that we're, we're working on right now. I don't have any data to show you uh, other than to say that you know, we're, we're trying to get at this right now. The other thing that we're trying to look at uh, is to get back to sort of the original question of what is important in specifying thorn identity. In citrus, we defined a particular pathway that we think is important, this TI1, TI2 pathway that's expressed in, in thorns as they develop to downregulate bushel expression. And so we simply want to ask, um, are similar mechanisms at play in, in the independent, other independent origins of thorns? And as I mentioned, thorns have evolved multiple times independently in the angiosperms. And so we're looking at a couple of different examples of thorns um, to see if this pathway is being reutilized in these other independent origins or if a totally different pathway is being used. Um, so in particular, we're looking at bougainvillea, um, which is, um, sort of a, a, a vine that you see in Florida. Um, we're looking at acacia, um, separate independent origin of thorns. We're not doing too much with hawthorn right now, um, which is here in the center. And basically we just wanna understand whether or not there's been co-option of other pathways. Um, as we showed uh, in the citrus example, there's the evolution of new promoter sequences to, to allow for this downregulation of Wuschel um, and Maybe similar things have happened in Wuschel promoters um, in these species as well. And more generally, we want to understand cis versus trans changes. Um, are, are there changes in, in promoters of genes like Wuschel? Are there ra radical changes in the transacting transcription factors, et cetera? So we're, we're currently working on this as well. OK. Um, let me just stop there for a second um, and check my time. I do have a few more minutes. So I'm going to actually, um, I'm going to stop for a second here and, and say, um, I'm going to, I've, I've sort of told you the story about thorns and brought you up to date on, on what we're, we've been doing with thorns. And I think we have the beginnings of an understanding of, of thorn identity in citrus. Um, and we're carrying this work on. What I want to spend the last few minutes of my time talking about um, is a, a slightly different project in the lab that grew out of our, our work to develop tools for working with citrus. Um, and this is a much more applied project, and I thought this might be of interest to, to some of you. So I'll, I'll just spend a few minutes describing this. So um, as some of you probably are aware, um, there's a a disease called citrus greening disease or Hualong Bing disease, um, often uh, abbreviated HLB. 
uh, which is a disease that's affecting citrus, the citrus crop in the US. And in fact, it's, it's a global scourge. It's affecting citrus crops around the world. Um, we're probably not too aware of this, um, me being here in Connecticut right now and you guys being in Indiana right now. But um, those of you who, whoops, who live or work in uh, the southern have lived or worked in the southern states are probably very well aware of this this disease um, this disease is a bacterial disease um, the bacteria um, is a liberobacter uh, type of bacteria abbreviated c -LAS. it's vectored by uh, what's called a, a svilid an insect um, and so here you see on this leaf, these sphilids, they're, they're basically biting the, the leaves of the citrus plant and injecting this bacteria uh, into the phloem, um, and that will infect the plant. Um, and plants that are susceptible to uh, HLB um, will eventually produce misshapen uh, green fruit, hence the name citrus greening. Um, fruits won't ripen properly, and in about five years or so, the disease will kill the trees. And for those of you who have been in the fields of Florida, um, in the central, central area of Florida, where there's lots and lots of citrus farms, you may have seen scenes like this. It's, it's really a devastation of, of the citrus uh, industry. Um, the trees are really just all dying across Florida. So this disease started about 18, or, or was first seen in the US about uh, 18 years ago or so, first in, in the southeast and it is now spread across the west and about two or three years ago uh, citrus greening has been observed in California so it's it's definitely spread across the citrus growing areas and if we just look at what's happened in Florida um, there's been about a 60 percent reduction in the production of oranges uh, in citrus in general in Florida due to losses predominantly due to citrus greening disease um, so there's been a huge loss um, in the citrus crop. And those of you who pay attention to the price of orange juice in the supermarket are probably aware that orange juice costs a lot more now than it did you know, 10 years ago. And that's in large part because of Hualong Bing disease. So because we've developed tools for working with citrus, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is, is generate um, plants that have reduced susceptibility to citrus screening disease, to HLB disease using CRISPR-Cas9. So there are lots of different ways in which a plant can be susceptible to a bacterial pathogen. Um, and uh, so uh, this is one illustration of how that can work in this sort of cartoon form. This bacteria, in this case, once it's introduced into the plant, produces an effector. That effector interacts with um, host gene products. And in the case of uh, HLB, these interactions leads to essentially the blockage of the phloem um, and eventually sort of clogging up the phloem and killing the plant. And so the idea here is very simple. If we can ident identify susceptibility genes, then in principle, we can knock out those susceptibility genes using CRISPR-Cas9 technologies um, uh, such that uh, bacterial infection uh, will will produce uh, will not affect the plant very much, and there will be reduced susceptibility to bacterial infection. So we are actually embarking on a large scale effort to to generate um, a population of plants um, to test this idea and to test up uh, a number of, to test a number of genes that we think might be susceptibility genes. So the first thing we did was we carried out a series of metagenomic analyses to try and identify candidate susceptibility genes based on evidence that uh, has been out in the citrus uh, field for, for a number of years, out in many, many publications. Susceptibility genes are generally upregulated in response to pathogen attacks. So that was one way in which we identified such genes. So we identified about a, over, a little over a thousand genes that we thought were good candidates for being susceptibility genes. We're in the process of generating uh, multiplex CRISPR-Cas9 constructs. We have demonstrated that multiplex CRISPR-Cas9 works well in citrus. We've cloned about 150 constructs so far. Um, we're, our goal is to generate 300 constructs to target about 1,200 genes. 
and introduce those into citrus um, using uh, transformation approaches that we've uh, improved, regenerate those plants, check them for gene editing, and then eventually phenotype them. So we're in the process of developing this pipeline and we're talking to people in California now about ways to phenotype the first plants that we're starting to get out of this pipeline. So it'll be a few years yet before we have answers on this, but at least um, we can start to tackle this, this disease um, using CRISPR-Cas9 technologies. I think the science is, is actually quite straightforward for doing this. What's more problematic um, in terms of using CRISPR-Cas9 to modify a commodity like citrus is whether or not such gene edited plants, if we can produce them and if they show um, increased uh, resistance or tolerance to HLB, can they succeed in the marketplace? And we think that this is actually the harder part of the whole project. Um, we're actually, we're, we, we're now are collaborating with several economists who are expert, agricultural economists who are experts in uh, surring, uh, surveying populations as to their attitudes about genetically modified plants in an effort to try and understand better what the hurdles are for, for community acceptance of, of GM or gene edited uh, material in the marketplace. So we think that this is actually the hardest step um, is to get buy-in from the public that these kinds of products uh, are useful and valuable and can uh, improve and increase our, our, our food capabilities. So with that, I will finish up. Um, I want to thank all the people that have been involved in the work. Um, most of my lab is now involved in citrus work. I'm, I'm valiantly trying to keep a Arabidopsis and some tomato work going on in the lab, but most people really want to work on citrus. It's a really fun system. Um, most of the work I talked about today was the work of a previous postdoc, Fei Zhang, who just recently left the lab uh, and is setting up his own lab at Shenzhen University, uh, along with Yahweh Wang, um, who is a technician in the lab. Uh, she's uh, also at Shenzhen now. Uh, so Fei did an amazing job. He did much of the TI1 and TI2 work that I described to you today. Um, Cynthia and Archana, um, are working on um, um, the HLB project, uh, and Ivy as a graduate student who's working on the, the newer aspects of thorn development that I just mentioned, um, and trying to understand how thorns versus axillary buds are specified. Um, we also had help from a lot of uh, great collaborators. The ones I want to call out here are Yannick Jacob, um, who helped us with the, the initial CRISPR-Cas9 um, assay system, um, Vladimir Orbovich, uh, our long-term co collaborator at the Citrus Research and Experiment Station in Lake Alfred, uh, who's helped us with all things citrus over the years, uh, and Lisa House and Bashir Kassas, who are the two economists at the University of Florida who are helping us out with the, these um, reach, uh, reach out surveys. Um, and also Ed Stover, who's been enormously helpful um, in all things citrus. And of course, thanks to our funding sources um, for the work I described to you uh, today. So I'll stop there um, and I'll answer any questions if there are any. So I'll stop sharing now. Thanks for the beautiful talk. And uh, please uh, unmute yourself to ask question or, yeah, or leave on the chat box. Yeah, thanks for the very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question mm -hmm. regarding the uh, susceptible and resistant disease, susceptible and disease resistance um, citrus. So, what are the ways that um, to identify the susceptible gene, the kind of susceptible gene? Because if you compare two cultivars together, there are going to be a lot of uh, polymorphism variation. So, uh, what is the way to narrow down those leaves? So this actually, it's, it was not trivial to do this. Um, so uh, Jeffrey Thompson, a, a postdoc actually in Yannick's lab, um, did a lot of this work. He's actually a, a joint postdoc between our two labs. He did a lot of this work, um, basically writing some scripts. So we have actually, so let me step back. So there's a lot of inf transcriptomic information from a number of different citrus species that we yeah. can utilize. And there's also proteomic. Uh, so we also looked at proteome uh, information as well. Um, we could then, Jeffrey could write scripts to compare um, the sequences um, that he got um, from these transcriptomic studies and try and parse out which 
which were consistent across multiple studies. And that, that was actually one of the criteria that we used. It wasn't just whether or not um, we saw a difference in the one particular transcriptomic study, but we, we actually grouped these into trying to find those that um, we saw consistency across many studies. Um, so we couldn't include everything, of course, um, because we just didn't have appropriate sequence information for everything, but there is a lot of genomic information out there already. So we had a lot to build this on. So, so that's how we came up with this, this number um, of about a thousand or so uh, susceptibility genes. We're, we, think, we think there's a good chance we'll hit on something that's useful. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's be very promising. Uh, and when you look at the transcript from the, <coughs> I look me. at the expression level, I focus on the um, polymorphism in, in, in each transcript. Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, when you focus on the trans, when you analyze the transcriptomics, are you analyzing the expression, the differences in expression levels? Are you focused on the yeah. um, polymorphisms inside on, on, the transcript? Uh -huh. on, on, the, on the differences in expression level, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because this is, so I, I think I mentioned um, one of the things that pathogens tend to do is bacterial pathogens when they're infecting a plant, um, they're, they're, they upregulate these susceptibility genes. Um, that happens in, in many cases. So we thought that that was a good criterion to use. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Thank you. Amen. Uh, yeah, this is probably just me being naive about um, plant pathology, but they're not really, I mean, their function is not to be susceptible. They're, mm -hmm. they're doing something. Right. So do you have a way of assessing what the secondary effects of knocking those out might be? Yeah, so so we're so we are actually so to test for HLB. Oh, let me let us step back. So we're making these populations here in-house at Yale. We're not a citrus growing state, um, <laughs> obviously. Um, and there's no HLB here. In, in Connecticut. Um, so all of our plants are naive. So what we are doing is we're, we're just trying to phenotype them and see that they are, are sort of robust plants. Um, and that's what we're just in the beginning stages of that. So that's also part of the analysis is just to sort of do a general phenotyping of our population. And then we actually, it's a, we have to use a BSL-3 uh, uh, setup in California to actually do the testing. HLB is, you know, HLB disease, it's so devastating. It's really, really highly regulated. So we have to, we will, there's a long permitting process just to get our material out to California and get it tested. Um, so the first thing we're doing um, as we're just getting the plants through, the first plants through now um, is just doing some basic phenotyping. We can't test everything, but just see that they're robust plants. Um, but people have, you know, this is not sort of a new concept. People have done this in other species. Um, so for instance, the sweet genes, which you may be aware of, um, sweet gene activity is upregulated in response to many bacterial pathogens. And it's the pathogen is actually upregulating the, the sort of transport of sucrose to better feed the pathogen, basically. Um, uh, and that doesn't, that doesn't really disrupt um, the, if you knock out the sweet genes, that doesn't really disrupt growth in any, any, to any degree really. Um, so, so this kind of thing has been done before. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the sort of, there is proof of concept. Yeah. I think Sharon has a question. I've got a question about um, the thorn project. Mm -hmm. um, so you have these two meristems mm -hmm. and is it, Mutually exclusive, whether you get a thorn or a branch in an axle in wild type development, or do you always have a thorn? Um, do you know anything about that? I might have missed. So, so, so in the cultivar we are using, and I want to be very specific here because the this, this sit range that we're using. Um, produces thorns extremely regularly, um, which is nice for our studies. So I'm, I don't know. <laughs> so on one side of the leaf, there's a thorn uh, and the axle of that leaf. And on the other side, there's the axillary meristem. So this axillary meristem is dormant. I mean, you can you know, decapitate as I showed you and get it to grow mm -hmm. out. It behaves just like a typical axillary meristem, like a branch. This thorn is determinate in terms of its development. And every node looks like that. It has two meristems, a thorn and an axillary meristem. And it never sends out branches that 
that cultivar that you're working on. Oh, well, it does, but, right. yeah, but it will be from the axillary meristem, not from the thorn. Right, but there will still be a thorn also. Yeah, so my question be... was, is there some interplay between the two meristems? That... We, we think there is. Um, actually, what I, an experiment I didn't describe to you, but that we're actually doing um, is we're trying, um, we're using diphtheria toxin to ablate one meristem or the other, since we have promoters now that are specific, um, the, the problem is those promoters are not very strong, um, but we do have promoters at, at this point that we can express predominantly in one meristem or the other and ablate those meristems genetically and see if there's an interaction between the two. So that's one thing that we're trying to address right now. Right. Yeah, yeah. Great talk. I have one question. So mm -hmm. you mentioned you mentioned the isolation of a few key TCP family transcription factor. Um, can you find the homolog of this gene, the gene in Arabidopsis or in yeah. other species? Yeah. So I, what I didn't mention, I sort of skipped over it. Um, T, uh, TI1 is the homolog of branched one. Ah, and wow. TI2 is the homolog of branch two. Cool. <laughs> um, so, so in Arabidopsis, they have very similar roles uh, in that they that the branch one and branch two genes are are responsible for branch production in Arabidopsis, right? Um, so when you mutate them, you get ex you get ex ectopic or you get extra branching being produced. Um, but it's a it's sort of a novel function in citrus because you have this novel structure. So. Yeah, seems the conserved gene has the, the, the unique function. Yeah, nice. and we think that has to do with this, at least in part, has to do with this uh, evolution of these new sequences in the Wuschel promoter that allow for TI1 to bind to it. Some of the following, I'm oh, sorry, Dan. Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, oh, go ahead, you Oh yeah, so I, had, I have one following question. So have you uh, carefully examined many different, uh, the sequence of the Wuss promoter in many different species? And uh, this is the, I, I just want to wondering, this, is, this uh, sequence is the citrus specific or is this uh, kind of like uh, conserved in a broader lineages? We're doing that right now. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't, I, it's it's sort of an obvious question, and we just yeah. we we got started on that before the pandemic, and then it just sort of stopped because of the pandemic. So we're just getting back to it now. But yes, uh, we're trying be to really, do that. really exciting. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I just the great talk, Vivian. I, Thank I would, you. Um, I just thought it was so impressive how quickly you converted citrus to a, a model system, and I I didn't know. Like, um, you know, what are the big bottlenecks that you face with, with this type of research question? And have you dabbled with single cell seek? And would that be a big deal to accelerate these types of projects? Um, we've been talking about, talking about dabbling in single cell seek. Um, yeah, it would help some things. I, I, I don't think the molecular side is as challenging as, as the plant side, so to speak. Um, so one of the the he, we could never have gotten this project going if we didn't have a really good CRISPR Cas9. So so I have to emphasize this is a tree species. It takes ten to twelve years to flower. So we are doing genetics on the the equivalent of T zero plants, right? In Arabida, we we are infecting um, in tissue culture, and then we're looking at what grows out of tissue culture. So we have to have really good mutagenesis, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to occur to see anything. Um, so that really was the bottleneck was to get that working efficiently so that we can look right then in the, in the plants that are growing out of those tissue cultures. We can propagate them vegetatively, which is nice. So we can maintain any line for many, many you know, iterations, but, um, but that was a huge bottleneck. Mm -hmm. Thanks some maybe the time so let's thank the dr irish again for the great talk thank you all for coming <laughs> so yeah and i think you and i are going to stay here <laughs> <laughs>
yeah if you have do you have oh, time yeah, yeah. 